can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, to follow God's word, we're going to be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I going to marry? What kind of life am I going to live? How am I going to raise my kids? What am I going to do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Welcome friends to another week of the choices we face. I'm Peter Herbeck. And it's my delight to have switched seats with Ralph. Ralph is uh, the guest today, we could say. What right? a relief. I don't have to worry about the time. <laughs> you, you have know. to watch the clock. You're totally responsible. Yeah. You know, if I run out of things to say, you got to start talking. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, it's just great being yeah. a guest. Well, one of the things I'm, I'm really excited about genuinely is our topic today. We're talking about the final judgment. And over, over the years, you know, Ralph has been a very clear voice on sort of the, the things that happen at the end times, the return of the Lord, the final judgment. And it's really critical. And the saints tell us time and time again to actually think about our death. Yeah. You know, that, that wise people consider their death and what's coming in the future. Yeah. And we know for sure two things about our future. One, we're going to die. And there's an appointment in our future to stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, every single human being, whether they believe it or not, whether they understand it or not, that day is coming and the Lord wants us to be prepared for that day. It's critical that we're prepared for it. So that's what we're gonna talk about, right? Yes, and every single Sunday, every Catholic recites the Nicene Creed where he says, I believe he's coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Really? Yeah. Do you really believe that? I mean. In our culture today, it's like, it's a culture that doesn't really believe in ultimate consequences. You yeah. know, it basically says, well, you know, whatever, it's going to work out okay, you know. And what do you mean God's going to judge the living and the dead? I mean, God's so merciful. I mean, everybody's going to be judged okay. No. Yeah. No, and this is the shocking thing. Something could be so clear in sacred scripture, so clear in the tradition of the church, so clear in the catechism of the Catholic Church, but we just somehow tune it out. We It yeah. just doesn't fit into the modern mentality. So we tune it out. So we got to have a breakthrough. We got to let scripture really break through and wake us up because life is short. And the only thing, one thing is necessary that we die in friendship with the Lord. And everybody doesn't die in friendship with the Lord. Some people don't want to be friends with the Lord. Yeah. And I think, Ralph, the living with an eternal perspective is something that has always been present in the history of the church. The early church was really preoccupied with the saints, always had it in their mind. Because if you have an eternal perspective, you know what's coming, you know what the destinies are. It's going to impact the way you live, the way you speak, yeah. and, and what you're doing on the earth. Yeah. But something's flipped. They're like It's like the script has been flipped a little bit yeah. in the world so that the main thing is, oh, yeah, yeah, it's coming. But look, this is where the action is. And everybody's focused on this world realities. And then there's voices in the church um, even in the church itself, yeah. even at high levels, yeah. like, yeah, don't worry so much about, don't be thinking about all that so yeah. much, you know, be focused here, fix the world, enjoy your ride, all that kind of stuff. And it doesn't produce the clarity and the urgency and the healthy fear of God yeah. that is critical for people to have to live well, according to the kingdom of God. You know, Right. The and from the first book of the Bible, Genesis to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, it's all about the consequences of the choices we make, which is why we call our TV the program choices. the choices we face. We're facing choices. You know, God said, you know, don't don't eat of this tree or you're gonna die. And so what, what do us dumb human beings do? We eat of the tree and yeah. guess what? We die. Yeah. You know, the guy doesn't say, oh, I was just bluffing, I was just kidding. No, I don't want you to die. You know, no, we die. And the reason why, Death is shadowing the human race. The reason why all of us die, the reason why all the other things that come from rebelling against God is so so present in the world today, sickness and betrayal and lust and greed and oppression and child trafficking and all the horrible things that go on in the world is because 
we're suffering the consequences of rebellion against God, you know? Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation, it talks about how well, Jesus, first of all, he says, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, but rather be afraid of he who can kill soul and body in hell. And, and the book of Revelation shows us that there's gonna be a final judgment, the great judgment, and there's gonna be a separation of the human race. There's gonna be people who are welcome into God's kingdom, and they're gonna be people who are gonna experience the second death. So we're not really have to, you know, Jesus tells us don't be afraid of the first death, biological death, but be very afraid of the second death. The second death is eternal separation from God. And if we die unrepentant, if we die in serious sin, if we die in anger and hatred and unbelief and rebellion against God, we're gonna experience the second death. And the way the scripture describes it in the book of Revelations, we're gonna be thrown into the, the lake of fire. Now, I, I used to hear that word and it just didn't kind of connect, you know? Yeah. I just kind of keep on reading type of thing. But then I started to pay attention about who's in the lake of fire. Hmm. And I was very surprised <laughs> about who's in the lake of fire. First of all, unbelievers. You know, of course, what that's really talking about is culpable unbelief, people who have been illumined by God, people who have heard the gospel, people who actually know that Jesus is the Lord but refuse to submit to him, refuse to believe in him, refuse to bow the knee to him, refuse to ask for mercy from him. Unbelief, culpable unbelief. And then cowards. That's from the book of Revelation, isn't it? It's one of the yeah. vice lists. Is that what they call them? Where well, they talk? It's, 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 it's people who are in the lake of fire. Now, yeah. I, I, I would have never put cowards in the lake of fire. I would consider that a minor offense, you know? Yeah. But Jesus says, you know, if you are ashamed of me before people, I'm going to be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. You say, wow, that is, that is kind of tough. That's kind of strong, you know? You know, is that really merciful? Well, it's merciful because Jesus is warning us. He's saying it's a terrible thing not to value the gift of Jesus. It's a terrible thing not to value his sacrifice on the cross. It's a terrible thing to reject all the expressions of mercy and all the gifts of light and love that God is giving us. It's a terrible thing. Yeah. And once we reject it, when we come before the judgment seat of Christ, we can't participate in it. So cowards. So mm -hmm. now this is this is I know this is challenging, but I really gotta I gotta tell you that you really need to ask the Lord for courage. You really need to ask the Lord for fidelity. And the only way we're gonna get through the days ahead and all the temptations and all the trials is out of personal loyalty to Jesus Christ. We need to develop a friendship with Jesus Christ. We need to become his friend. We need to be willing to even die for him rather than to deny him. That's that's the glory of the Catholic Church. You know. The, yeah, and it's really what uh, the way Jesus talked to the apostles, like the Last Supper discourse, fully expecting, he says, what's going to happen to me is going to happen to you. And you, I'm going to give you the strength. He said they would die, have to die for their faith. You know, he, he said, and pay a high price. Yeah. And and he made it clear that paying a high price is part of the normal Christian life. Yeah. And so we haven't had to do a lot of that as Americans, right? right? We get rewarded for growing up. We would get rewarded for standing for things that the church stands for. Yeah. But that that's changing now. Yeah. And just a little cancellation is causing people to back away or I'm getting away from the church. I don't want to be identified with the church because it's going to make me unpopular. Yeah. It's going to cost me something. So it's it comes right down to the concrete level, this idea of being having the courage to be a faithful witness to Christ. Right, and as the gap opens up between what it means to follow Christ and what the culture is telling us we should do and what we should believe and what we should value, it's getting harder for people. We've been used to a certain symbiotic kind of live and live, let, 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 live and let live and, and you know, a certain support that the culture gave to faith and keeping the Ten Commandments, but that's, that's breaking down now. Christian culture is yeah. breaking down. Uh, all the major, sort of power centers in society are moving towards a hostility to Christ and the church and punishing people who won't yeah. go along with the new creed. To try yeah. to silence us, to try to yeah. be, get people to conform. Now, the as you're talking, Ralph, of what's in the lake of fire, no, you're just getting started. Yes. But what part of what this reveals is partly what is the basis of the judgment yeah. of the final judgment yeah, right. when we meet the Lord, no, right? No, that's very yeah. good, yeah. So, yeah. Well, let's start with that summary of the gospel. Everybody knows John chapter 3, verse 16. God so loved the world. 
that he gave his only son, that who believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Very short, simple statement, but it's a true statement of the gospel. It's all about love. That's why we exist. That's why the universe exists is because he loves us. And we're here because we're loved. But we're also here because we rebelled and we participated in the sin of our first parents. And we experienced death. Death is at work in our body. We're going to die. Uh, many of us have illnesses. Many of us have experienced tremendously painful human relationships and, and betrayal and rejection and unfairness and oppression and unfairness in work and all those things. But God has not abandoned us. And the way he's expressing his love to us in our fallen condition is sending us his son. Unbelievable, amazing, who would have ever thought of it? But here's, here's the deal. Whoever believes in his son, whoever believes in him, and the kind of faith that the Bible talks about isn't just, oh yeah, I believe in him and go on with your life. Whoever actually believes in him and the scripture talks about the obedience of faith, actually doing what our faith shows us, acting on what our faith shows us is true, relating to as a relationship of discipleship to the person that we believe in. So whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So there's the consequences. The judgment is that those who reject Jesus uh, those who don't believe in Jesus, those who don't obey Jesus, are risking perishing. That's condemnation. It talks about condemnation. That's eternal separation from God. That's hell. But then again, the gift is so amazing. Eternal life. Life without death. Life without suffering. Supernatural life. Life that never ends. Immortality. Infinite love infinite truth, infinite beauty, infinite goodness. That's, that's the good news. But the good news says, you know, there's consequences to reject it. You know, a gift is being offered, but if you don't receive the gift, judgment. So one of the, one of the criteria of judgment, so to speak, is, is faith. You know, those who believe in what's being announced to the human race through the gospel. And how do you express that belief from a kingdom perspective? When the Lord looks at us, like I was, I was just thinking of Jesus saying, if you love me, you're talking about love, yeah. you'll keep my commandments. Right. This is the link that seems to be missing in contemporary culture. The, the idea that following in the footsteps of Jesus and be, in living the commandments and pursuing those with all mm -hmm. your heart, we fall, God forgives us. But really, that's where our heart is. I want to be obedient to God the Father mm -hmm. and God the Son in my life. Yeah. And so then you were just touching on the, the reality of those who are in the lake of fire, yeah. are those who are in some clear way not obeying the Lord yeah. and not accepting his commandments. And yeah. so there's a there's a bunch of those lists in the New Testament yeah. that you you talk about regularly yeah. that people don't even hardly pay attention to anymore. Yeah. I don't think it's at issue anymore. It's not yeah. that big of a deal. Yeah. You know, so I think the anyway, what what would you well, say? Well, well, who else is in the lake of fire? Yeah. Fornicators. Fornicators. Like yeah. Are you crazy? What's wrong with fornication? I mean, everybody's doing it. You know, we're in a new culture now. We now understand it's just fine for people who love each other to have sex with each other. It's fine even people who don't love each other to have sex with each other. Everybody's doing it. Yeah. God's word says, no, sex is a special gift that God's given us to bring together a man and a woman and giving them the privilege of becoming one flesh, a deep personal communion between a man and a woman and bringing forth new life. What a privilege God has given the human race with the gift of human sexuality. But then God makes absolutely clear that any exercise of sexuality outside of holy marriage, open to life, is seriously wrong because we actually become part of Christ's body. And St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, how would you even consider taking your body and making them part of a, of, of a prostitute. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're Christ's body. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. You've been claimed by Christ. You're holy. And, and then there's so many other things the scripture is saying that, you know, actually there's a lot of deception in this area. You know, 1 Corinthians 
chapter 6, Paul says, don't let anybody deceive you. The immoral, and the underlying Greek word means sexually immoral, will not enter the kingdom of God. Now, if this doesn't shock you, it should. We, we have friends, we have relatives who are doing the things that scripture says will exclude us from the kingdom of God unless we repent before we die. So this should shock you. This should upset you. This should concern you. And Paul goes on to be very specific. The adulterer, the fornicator, the person who engages in homosexual activity. Paul's not talking about tendencies, not talking about temptation in any of these areas, but doing things with your body that the Lord says dishonors the body and seriously violates his purpose in making a sexual being than the robber, the drunkard, the idolater, and so on and so forth. So honestly, Peter, you know, so many of us have been lulled into accepting this because so many people are doing it. And so many of us are lulled into it and actually emotionally manipulated by people who are very close to us, family members, brothers or sisters, uh, who are engaging in adultery or fornication or homosexual activity or pornography or masturbation or all the things that are a misuse of sexuality. And we say, well, I love these people, so I really can't condemn them. It's not our job to condemn anybody, but if we love them, we really need to warn them that they're in danger. And this, these aren't just arbitrary rules that God's given us, hoops that we need to uh, right. jump through. This is his wisdom about this, this path leads to happiness. This path leads to life. This path leads to fruitfulness on this earth and eternal life. This other path leads to pain, it leads to destruction, it leads to misery, it leads to broken relationships, it leads to disease, it leads to, it leads to pain here on this earth and then also forever. So, hey, Rob, it's important to note, friends, is how clear the Word of God is. And we know the Bible is literally the Word of God, and the Catechism echoes all of this for us so clearly that we can know what matters to the Lord and the basis upon which people's judgment yeah. will experience the judge and the final judgment yeah. of God based on these things. But in the culture and even in the church today, voices, strong voices in the church to say, well, you know, um, you know, th that there's all kinds of loving acts that are okay. The Bible doesn't speak you know, definitively about all this stuff. We know better now that yeah. some acts, which are homosexual acts can be, you know, virtuous and good and celebrated. Yeah. Yeah. You know, some acts of young people outside of marriage, older people outside of marriage, as long as they're loving acts, yeah. they're okay. It's all confused. It's like a big fog machine yeah. is out there and people aren't seeing clearly. So as a result, number one, we all have, you know, human beings have temptation of those kinds. There's yes. a very strong desire, yeah. right? right? And as lonely as the world is, how dark the world is, people want to feel differently. And yes. one of the most powerful powerful feelings you can have of being united to somebody is sexual activity. Yeah. So it's easy to trip and fall in that area. And this is the wrong time for the, the voices in the church to be yes. confused. Yeah. This is where people really need to be fortified and helped because it really matters. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah. And that's why Paul leads off by saying, don't let anybody deceive you. Yeah. Was there voices even in the early church deceiving people in this area? Yeah. You know, there, there are voices all throughout Christian history deceiving people about who Christ is, about what he requires of us. Now, another thing here is, you know, I mentioned how Paul appeals for his teaching to the fact that we belong to Christ, we're his body. Well, there's another text at the end of Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 16, where Jesus is giving people his command to, to go and preach the gospel to every creature. And then he says, those who are baptized those who believe and baptize will be saved, but those who refuse to believe and be baptized will be condemned. Mm -hmm. so, so, but when we're baptized, we're actually brought not just into a notional relationship with the Lord, but we're brought into actually the Lord dwelling within us. And so this is really key too, because not by our own human strength are we able to live the law of God, but God now is dwelling in us and wants to give us the encouragement, the strength, the consolation, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit to actually put to death the, the deeds of the flesh and have the fruits of the Spirit really become more and more common in our life. Yeah, no, no question about it. Ralph, so 
Um, I wanted to, if I can shift the conversation. Hey, you're the boss. You can do okay, whatever you want. Okay, I'm in charge want. today. There yeah, we go. You're yeah, in charge. Yeah. You okay, can do whatever great, you want. Great, great, yeah. I'm, I'm going to just do so, what you asked me to so, do. So, you know, people ask the question, well, well, are there two judgments at the end for me? Like, what am I in store for? What's going to happen when yeah. I die? Yeah. Can you say some of that about the judgment yes. and what's going to be like? Yes. This is something that the church has definitively d- decided on. Uh, I think in the book of Acts, it says that after death, the judgment. And there's only... One death, there's only one judgment, it's not second chances. And what the church has said, well, it's actually, when each of us die, we're judged, and we know where we're going. You know, heaven, hell, or purgatory, we can say a little bit about purgatory, but uh, heaven, hell, or purgatory. But then there's gonna be, at the end of time, a public manifestation of the justice and mercy of God. And it's gonna be shown for everybody to see how, how true his words were, how just his actions are, how totally fitting and appropriate the the destiny of each person. You know, we're never gonna, we're not gonna have any arguments with God about his fairness. We're just gonna be, our breath's gonna be taken away. Will and, every human being that's ever been created be there at that, that moment? That's it, yep. And we somehow see ourselves and other people in the totality of what we were, we're you know, we're, and what we now are, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, well, yeah. well, my sins, you know, the sins of my life be, be somehow made known to everybody in, you know, that was created, but I'll be able to celebrate it because God's wisdom was revealed in salvation. You know what I mean? Because a lot of people it, it, wonder it, about that. Yeah, like, it, it could be that or it could be something different. We don't really know okay. the details All right. of, of how that manifestation of the justice of God is going to be expressed itself. But we can be sure it's going to be both just and merciful. Yeah. And at that point, we're not going to have any argument with him about whatever he does. We say, Lord, that was a perfect way of doing it. Thank yeah, we'll you. He'll be like, wow, yeah, yeah, how wise yeah. he was. This is amazing. Yeah, and, and I'm how, so grateful for it. how kind yeah. and how merciful yeah. and how fair and how many chances he gave the people. You're right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the first judgment is what? When it, when, it's when it called a particular indiv- judgment when we die. Yeah, we're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to have to give an account of our life and we're going to be judged on the basis of how we've responded to the light that God's given us. We might want to say something about people who never have a chance to hear about Jesus. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, yeah. God's going to give everybody a chance to be saved. And some people on this earth, even to this day, maybe haven't heard about Jesus, though it's getting harder and harder not to hear about him right. because of the global communication stuff that's going on right now and all the languages that the gospel's being kind of translated into it, all the people who are trying to reach people in every part of the world. But what the Catholic Church basically says, based on Scripture, Romans chapter 1 says, everybody can know something about God because just look at the creation. You can see that God exists. So the, the creation testifies to the existence of God. And God expects people then to seek to know him. And Romans chapter 1, it says, they didn't seek to know him. They didn't thank him. Uh, but they, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and they worshiped the creature rather than the creator. They're, they're without excuse. They're, they're actually culpably responsible yeah. for, for the That's very, very sobering, and people yeah. don't talk about that very yeah. much. And yeah. Revelation chapter 2 yeah. says, uh, or, no, Romans chapter 2 says, everybody will be judged on the basis of the light that God's given them. So, and John chapter 1 says, Jesus is the true light coming into the world, giving light to the whole world. So God is going to give everybody an opportunity to perceive him in some way. They may not know the name of Jesus, but there's going to be some Some dimension of light. Yes, given to them. And they're going to have then a chance. Am I going to believe what was just shown me? Am I going to surrender to it? Am I going to seek to know more what the implications of it are is? And scripture says, and and church formally teaches, uh, Constitution of the Church, section uh, 16, it says that it's possible for people to be saved without hearing the gospel, but it's only under certain conditions that they're sincerely seeking God, that they're not culpably ignorant for not hearing the gospel, that they're trying to live according to the light of conscience that God has given them. But then it goes on to say that very often this isn't the case. Yeah, that's why we and, should be preaching the yeah, gospel. That's why really we shouldn't it, yeah. presume that people are saved. We shouldn't presume they're damned either. Right. But we should urgently be concerned about their salvation. Yeah, because something's really, really at stake. Yeah, they're going to appear yeah. before the judgment seat of Christ, yeah. and we can't judge their soul. But if they're doing these things that, that Scripture says will exclude them from the kingdom of God, we should be very concerned about them if we yeah. love them. Yeah. Ralph, I think uh, we just have a couple of minutes left, but I think when I read the New Testament, you see how the apostles are always exhorting people to look with longing 
yeah. for the coming of the Lord. Yes. Yeah. And they had, a, they had a relationship to the end that we don't seem to have. Like in the contemporary world, it's like, what a buzzkill. Number one, to think about your death or to think about all of that. Like, that's just, you know, not good. But they said, no, look for joy. How should Christians think about that meeting that's in the future with the Lord in our passing? Romans chapter 8, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If we are living as best we can in relationship to the Lord, if we're trying as best we can to keep his commandments, if we fall, if we get up and confess our sins, we have nothing to fear. And we even can look forward to the hope that if this purification is still needed in our life before we die, the Lord's gonna provide that yeah. in purgatory. And purgatory just means that we're not ready to see the incredible, full, infinite light of God yet. There still needs to be purification going on in our soul, but God in his mercy is gonna do it for us. Yeah. And so if we're in purgatory, we're saved. It's just a temporary state. And so, you know, and, and the book of Revelations that talks about the lake of fire, it also talks about God wiping away the tear from every eye yeah. and God being everything to everyone and the tremendous communion of love that's gonna be ours. So uh, it, it's right now there's this pain in this life, this imperfection in this life. There's more than that, there's evil in this life. It's gonna go away and it's gonna yeah. be the fulfillment of our deepest desires for union, for love, for happiness forever. Yeah. What we are all made for and the yeah. only thing that will ultimately satisfy the deep longings of our heart mm -hmm. is gonna, come to be, and the only one who can make it come to be for us is Jesus, is, you know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, yeah. bringing us home to the heart of God and into the family of God. And I know we've just touched on this subject, but Ralph, thanks so much yeah. for all that you do in this area, you know, helping people again and again understand the, the, the urgency, the eternal consequences, the fundamental truths that are there. I mean, I remember you impacted my life way back 40 some years ago when you were talking about some of these things mm -hmm. and it really woke me up, helped mm -hmm. wake me up. To the uh, whole that's what we're all so, doing at Renewal Ministries. Yeah, it? that's yeah. really, that really is what we're trying of, to do. Yeah, yeah. For sure, friends. And well, one of the things that we'd like to do is offer you this free booklet. You can call the 800 number. You can go to our website. We'll have a little link there, a little image of, of the Choices We Face program that you'll be able to get this booklet. We'll send it out to you for free. Peter Barak, one of our team members, writing, What Must I Do to Be Saved? It fits right into our topic today. Because, you know, the critical reality is where's my life going to end up? The destiny that's before me. And friends, we can live with joyful anticipation of the coming of the Lord. Mm -hmm. To just, and not to fear that day in a way that's slavish, but be happy and joyful knowing we're going to meet the Lord in his mercy. We will be saved. God bless you. Hope to see you next week. Jesus came to save us. All have sinned and the wages of sin is death. Without his death and resurrection, we would have no hope of eternal life. In the scriptures, Jesus' teaching on the conditions of salvation is consistent, urgent, and pervasive. But we often gloss over these passages or fail to recognize the vitally important truth Jesus is revealing about whether or not we will go to heaven. In my new booklet, What Must I Do to Be Saved?, I unpack several of these important moments in the Gospels to help us understand what Jesus is saying so we can find and stay on the narrow path that leads to eternal life. To get your copy, visit our website or call the number on the screen.